It's time to get inside the Giants huddle. Huddle up, huddle up, huddle up. On Giants.com. Here we go, here we go. And the Giants mobile Get them in there, let's go. Part of the Giants podcast network. Welcome to another edition of the Giants huddle podcast. I am John Schmelk. It's all brought to you by PSENG, energy efficiency for game time and any time. Visit PSEG.com slash Giants for discounts, rebates, and home energy assessments. Thanks for being with us today, everybody. This is our normal Friday podcast. We're going to have the head coach of the Giants, Brian Dable. He's with Bob Papa, previewing the Houston Texans with Lance Meadow and Paul Bettino. You're going to have former defensive lineman Seth Payne, who covers the team for Sports Radio 610 in Houston. And you're going to have my interview with Giants linebacker Jalen Smith. But first, a reminder. We've had a lot of Giant Huddle episodes this week, so make sure you go back and check out the ones we did earlier. Uh, you go back three episodes ago, we did our Reporters Roundtable. Paul Schwartz, Art Stapleton, Kim Jones, and I kind of just talked Giants at the bye. You go two episodes ago, we're back with our Papa's Perspective edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast. He talks to Rashad Jennings about a big game he had against the Texans eight years ago and about his time with the Giants. Actually, some really interesting stuff from Rashad there about some past Giant teams, leadership, and things like that. And then the prior episode, make sure you go check it out. This really is a must-listen, everybody. I have a nice one-on-one with the great Brian Baldinger from Baldy's Breakdowns and NFL Network, and we talk about the Giants and where they are, and we preview the matchup against the Texans a little bit as well. All right, let's get to it. My interview with Giants linebacker Jalen Smith. Jalen, how was the bye week, and, and do you sense, based on how your you and your teammates have come back, that it came at the right time? Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, anytime you 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 get an opportunity to to get away after a a, a nice start, a nice stretch, um, it's it's good for your mental, uh, good for your souls, good good for the team. Uh, it feels good to be back. Um, we got after it today, flying around, um, you know, prepping for our next game against Houston. For you, you were probably just kind of revving up, though, right? Because you weren't here for all of camp and the whole season. Were you kind of just hitting your stride? Did you maybe want to keep going a little bit? Yeah, I'm a competitor, uh, <laughs> you know, so I'm any any chance I get to, 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 to get out there and, and help the team, that's what I want to do. Um, you know, me coming in, what, after like week three or week four, joining the team, um, I've had a blast just getting to getting to know everybody. Um, I came for I came here last year, um, the last month of the season, so a lot of similar faces, also a lot of new faces with new coaches and things like that. So um, it was just a blessing to be a part of a great group, and we're all hungry. I was going to ask you, was it weird? You know, because you're here at the end of last year, then you're not here for a decent part of the off season. You get in here, you know, after a month or so. Same building, same cafeteria, same food, everything's the same, but. All the coaches and the schemes are completely different. Was that a weird dichotomy for you to kind of get used to? The food is delicious, by the way. <laughs> Shout out to the crew. Um, yeah, just a just a, a, a different vibe, a different energy. Um, you know, I can feel it. You know, me being a vet now, year seven, um, you you kind of understand the, the the chemistry of the team, um, and it shows. You know, but for us, we're like I said, we're dialed in, we're locked in. We we got a lot to prove. Um, and this is just the beginning. We got a nice start, but the only thing that matters is what we do now. What is it you like about Wink's defense and how he's using you? Um, I just love his tenacity. I love his tenacity. He gets after it. He believes in his guys. Um, you know, he he tries to maximize um, everyone's uh, potential and capabilities. Um, and, and you got to earn it. And that's what I love. Um, for me, being in the middle. Um, kind of quarterback of the defense type of vibe is something that I'm used to. And I'm just thankful to, to, to be able to contribute um, and make sure I work my ass off every day. And you're going to be missing a big part of your defense this week. Xavier McKinney is going to be out at least four games with an injury. Um, what does that loss mean to your defense, and how can you and the rest of the guys help make up for him not being out there? You know, uh, you know, X, he's a, he's a competitor. Um you know, and, and and that's that's the biggest thing about it. When you when you don't have a guy, a guy like him out there, you know he wants to be out there with us. Uh, but he is going to be with us. Um, just prayers to him. And, and then for us as a group, we got to we got to grind. That's the next man up mentality. Um, we got to do whatever it takes to to get the job done and get the win. To, so that's that's what our main focus is. Now he was the coach's calm guy. He had the green dot. Now Julian's going to get it. That's a job you had in Dallas before you came here. So how can you help Julian now communicate back to front? Absolutely. Uh, you know, big, the biggest thing for me is is making sure everybody's locked in and loaded. Um, Julian get the call in, get the call to me, and you know, it's my job to make sure that the defensive line has it, um, you know, the linebackers, 
um, are, are, are locked in and, and, and ready to go. So communication is something that I'm used to. Like I said, being in the middle, um, you know, for my career, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Um, you know, having Juju being a, uh, a Notre Dame guy as well. That's you know the, the chemistry is naturally there. Uh, we got a big win over the weekend versus Clemson, so uh, at home. So is is it's great great chemistry, uh, great vibes. Love being here in the Big Apple, and um, we're gonna do whatever it takes to get a win. So that's that's the only thing that matters. Weird maybe is the wrong word, but is it a little bit different for you pre snap not having that coach's com responsibility and having to communicate to the rest of the guys what calls coming in? Do you like? Not having that is strange. Not being the guy and having someone else do it, and you being on the field too. I'm a guy that's a sponge. I'm a natural, a natural leader. So whether I have the green dot or not, um, the the team, the defense will feel my presence. Um, it's something I, pr- I pride myself on, but it's also a gift from God. So I'm just thankful for to, for the ability to be out there. The biggest thing for me is what can I do to help add value to this team and. Um, you know, I know I can still play this game at a high level, mm-hmm. uh, which I have since I got in the league. And, and the only thing that matters, like I said, is what we do now. So I, I look forward to, to Sunday. Um, but we got to continue to prepare the right way. So that's that, that's what we'll do. Before I ask you about the opponent real quick, you've had a front row seat to the job Dexter Lawrence has done this year, playing behind him a lot. What is it like watching that big man go to work and you sometimes reaping the benefits of him getting a lot of attention? Absolutely. Uh, big sexy. He's a, <laughs> he's, he's a guy that's, that's passionate um, about the game, and he plays it the right way. So you love, um, you know, for me as a linebacker, I love being behind those guys, being behind, you know, Dex and, and Jelly and – uh, Leo, um, Heidi, we we played together before. So just the chemistry, the tenacity, we all want to do a great job. So um, it's it, it it's in the preparation, and, and that's something we're always constantly talking about. It's like, okay, how can I help um, free these guys up so they can go be the players that they are? Um, and then you know, vice versa, it works. It works hand in hand. All right, watching Damian Pierce on tape, boy, that guy's a bowling ball huh he can make you miss he bounces off you know shoulder tackles what's the challenge you guys have in slowing him down and the rest of that Texans offense um you have to respect the game and when you watch it and you see it's played the right way you see um a guy that that runs the ball uh the the right way you got to respect it um Earl Campbell type of vibe um so just it's, it's, it's a great challenge. It's something that we're looking forward to. Um, you know, we're going to see what, what, what our defense is made up uh, made up of. But um, you got to give credit where credit's due. Um, but like I said, we're going to continue to prepare the right way um, and get ready to get after it. Jalen, good stuff, man. Best of luck on Sunday against the Texans. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, brother. Hey, Giant fans, join us back at MetLife Stadium next Sunday, November 20th, to watch the Giants take on the Detroit Lions. Limited tickets are available. Visit Giants.com slash tickets to secure your seat today. That's Giants linebacker Jalen Smith. Interesting stuff from him. Unfortunately, our time is a little bit short. I had other stuff I wanted to get into, but we ran out of time. Um, But we thank him for joining us. Good stuff from Jalen. Now let's turn our attention to the Giants' opponent this week, the Houston Texans. Our very own Lance Meadow and Paul Dottino had a chance to talk to Seth Payne, former defensive lineman that covers the team for Sports Radio 610 in Houston. Giants return from their bye week with a two-game homestand. And first up in Week 10 at MetLife Stadium is the Houston Texans. To get more into this week's opponent, we're now joined by a man who played 11 seasons in the NFL as a defensive lineman for the Jaguars and the Texans. You can now hear him on Sports Radio 610 in Houston. None other than Seth Payne. Seth, you got Lance Meadow and Paul Dottino here on Giants.com. Greatly appreciate the time. Hope all is well. How's everything on your end? It's it's good. You know, uh, just your typical drama that comes with being a one-win football team uh, <laughs> in November. It's, a, it's one thing to be a one-win football team in September. There, there might seem some semblance of hope, but uh, we are where we are, and we're kind of trying to figure out what, what we can figure out about this team for the rest of the year. Completely understandable. And actually, that's where I want to start, because you look at the record, you say, OK, the Texans are having their fair share of issues, which is well documented. But with that being said, Seth, five of their eight games have been decided by one score. So they've been in a relatively high volume of their contest. I know there's a lot to digest, but if you had to pick one major issue, one Achilles heel, what would it be for the Texans this season? I think uh, I think the run defense is the thing that's really keeping them from being able to close out some of these games. It, they are, um, 
they are a weird team in their ability to hang around till the fourth quarter. And, but I wouldn't call them a team that's had bad luck or anything. I think in the fourth quarter, the talent of the opponent takes over and you can see that the opponent is certainly a better football team. I think that what happens is they just can't close these games out. Um, the, the defense is bend, but don't break. And they ultimately break in the fourth quarter. And then meanwhile, offensively, obviously you don't have the firepower. Um, I think Davis Mills has, has not taken a step forward. If anything, he might've regressed a little bit this year, but he also doesn't really have a lot of weaponry at tight end. Um, Brandon Cooks isn't the same guy he was the year before. And then there's extra drama added on top of it because he's unhappy about not getting traded. But the, I, I think that what Saquon Barkley and Daniel Jones and the, the, the Giants offensive line is looking forward to this week is that the Texans are just a bad run defense. Well, let me flip it, though, to the other side and talk about the Texans offense and their running game because Damian Pierce, to me, would get my midseason vote for NFL Rookie of the Year. I, I don't know exactly how great the offensive line has blocked, but I know this. Every time that I look at Pierce on the highlights or the clips or even getting to watch half a game, the guy is pretty good. Yeah, he he really, really is. I mean, it, we talked to people out of the University of Florida who who were, like, frankly, still angry that he didn't get more carries and more touches when he was in Florida. They, they cite Damian Pierce as one of the big reasons why uh, you could tell that it was time for Dan Mullen to go. Um, he's just, he's the right kind of kid. You can tell when he runs that he's tenacious. He's fourth in the NFL in yardage after contact per carry. And, you know, amongst rookies, he's by far the highest rookie in that regard. And, and when you talk to him, he's just the right kind of personality too. He's, he's always deflecting attention. You know, you you ask him a question about himself. He talks about the offensive line. He talks about the team. um, And he's just a very, very high energy guy. So we, we have him here and it's probably a little bit like you guys have had it with Saquon Barkley at times. Um, You feel like, okay, we've got this, uh, this guy with pistons for legs and uh, we can't do anything with him right now uh, because he's a young running back and it's just not, uh, it feels a little bit wasted at this point. Well, speaking of that, let's piggyback over that point, Seth, because one of the things you mentioned off the top was Davis Mills doesn't necessarily have a lot of weapons around him, and that's probably why they're lacking explosive plays. Then again, this is year two for him, and Pep Hamilton, Mm -hmm. who was his passing game coordinator, now his offensive coordinator, the touchdown-to-interception ratio may not jump off the page, but he's done a fairly good job of protecting the ball. Where have you seen his biggest development from last season when he was thrust into the mix to this year? I think um, a lot of the pre-snap stuff, when it comes to getting into the right protection, uh, when it comes to checking into the right run plays, we saw that versus Philadelphia. As as good as Philadelphia is, um, the Texans had some success running the ball kind of at will at times versus Philadelphia. They were without Jordan Davis, as you guys know, the the stud rookie nose tackle there. But uh, a lot of that was Davis Mills checking into the right run. So that part of it, he's gotten better. I think he's gotten better in some regards at handling the blitz and anticipating the blitz. So he gets his hot, he throws to his hot routes more quickly. I think part of where he just hasn't progressed is just in the, the genuine ability to push the ball downfield, to move within the pocket, you know, not necessarily to scramble. Uh, he's never going to be a Daniel Jones type of runner, um, but he's, he's got to be able to move, create space and still throw downfield. And he just hasn't developed that side of his game this year. We know about the uh, issues involving Brandon Cooks, the trade rumors and all the drama that surrounds him. So I won't even go there. I want to ask you about two guys who intrigue me. OJ Howard, who seems to have never lived up to his potential uh, thus far in the NFL. And Nico Collins, who when he came out of school uh, as a, as a number three uh, draft choice, I thought was actually going to be more of an impact player than he's been. What can you tell me about those two guys? Yeah. Um, you know, OJ Howard came in and was, was a little bit of a flash initially. And since then has been uh, kind of maybe how you describe him with his career. Hasn't done a whole lot. Um, and then you asked about Brevin Jordan. Uh, Nico Collins. Oh, oh, Nico Collins. I apologize. Sorry. Um, Nico Collins. Nico Collins has taken some steps forward and he, you know, he was banged up last week, but 
he's a guy that is never going to really get great separation. I don't think he has really good speed, but it's not that sudden type of speed where when he did, where you can just take off from somebody out of a break. Um, but he comes, he goes up and competes for the 50, 50 balls. He's got very, very good size. And I think he knows how to use it. He's going to be best when he can be used in complement with somebody like Brandon cooks. And that's, that's where the big question is now is okay. It's nice to get – if you have Nico Collins, then Brandon Cook is going to take some of the safety help away from Nico Collins, and he'll have more one-on-one opportunities. Brandon Cook just hasn't been quite the same guy this year, and now he's missed the last couple games after being upset about not getting traded, and nobody really knows what's going on there um, or, or what kind of drama there is. And, and we don't really know if he's uh, – you know, it's like what his status is from week to week at this point. We're talking with former NFL defensive lineman Seth Payne, who we could hear on Sports Radio 610 in Houston. Clearly, the function of the offense, Seth, as you can attest to, is always tied to the play of the offensive line. We were talking about the rushing attack, but what I think a lot of people overlook is the Texans' interior line this year is brand new. they are two guards, and then Scott Quesenberry replacing Justin Britt, who's been out since week two. What have you seen out of that group specifically? Because they seem to be in great shape with their bookends. They're two tackles. Yeah. What has the interior you know, you're, line produced? Yeah, you're exactly right on that. I think that they they're pretty solid on the edges. Um, I think the run blocking at both those positions has been better than it has been in the past. Uh, Laramie Tunsil seems to be more engaged as a run blocker. He's always been a good pass blocker, but he's more engaged as a run blocker this year. The center and the two guards have been an issue. Um, some of that's because of injuries. You know, Scott Quesenberry is a backup who's going to be the starter for the rest of the season. Kenyon Green, the left guard, is the first rounder who he he looks like he's going through that classic struggle of being a guy who is a big physical kind of bully of a guy in college and you know and doing it in the SEC, doing it at a high level, but realizing and understanding that you got to use technique in the NFL. So there's times where there's times where you'll see him be very physical and very dominant, but then there's other times where you're going to see him get bull rushed right back into the quarterback. So the consistency there with Kenyon Green just isn't there yet. Um, and you see it in flashes. I, I was, he had a tough go of it. You know, two weeks in a row, he had, he had the Titans with uh, that interior defensive line. Then he had the Eagles, uh, who, were, who were pretty staunch in their own regard. So hopefully over those last couple of weeks, he's learned something. Um, but he is, yeah, the, the Giants will have opportunities versus them. All right, let me flip it to the other side. And Seth, I got to ask you about the fountain of youth here with Jerry Hughes. The guy seems like he's been playing in this league for an awful long time. And yet here he stands sixth in the National Football League with seven sacks. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Brian Dayball, I know he referenced him in the, the conference call the other day. He, he, he knows him from Buffalo, obviously, and has a lot of respect for him. Jerry Hughes is a guy who grew up in Houston. We kept getting word through the grapevine all off season long that you know he still wanted to play football, even though he's 34 years old, and he really, really wanted to play for the Texans. And ultimately, it worked out. They eventually signed him. I think they're getting exactly what they want out of him, which is a a guy who's you know on pace right now to be double digit sacks. He'd be he'd be the first guy since JJ Watt uh, to have double digit sacks for the Texans. But he's also he's a, a, the type of veteran player that Nick Casario, the general manager, wanted to bring in and kind of set a template for, hey, we might be a bad football team, but we need to be sure that these young guys see the way it's supposed to be done. And they tried to have a couple of these guys at each position or at least at every you know position. Uh, you know, Christian Kirksey is a middle linebacker who's a you know kind of a journeyman codger type of guy, but does things the right way on the offensive line you've got a veteran or two um it's it, the wide receiver group you have brandon cooks who which is again the irony is brandon cooks was the guy who's supposed to teach guys how to be professional and do things the right way it looks like he went awol for a couple of weeks so uh <laughs> you know like it's because his feelings were hurt we don't know what we don't know exactly what the story is but um jerry hughes jerry hughes is one of the actual threats on the defensive line. Malik Collins, the defensive tackle, is another guy who's on a relatively short-term deal but gets pressure, doesn't show up as a sack, but he's a veteran guy that, that can play in this Lovey Smith style of defense. He's been banged up the last couple of weeks, so him getting back to health uh, is, is going to be a crucial thing for this Texans defense. 
Seth, not to get off topic, but the other thing that's quite comical is Brandon Cook signed a two-year extension this offseason with the team. So you'd figure if you committed to the team, it's understandable if maybe they don't work out a trade and they hold on to you. Oh, so. it's You know, it, honestly, it's been so dysfunctional around here for two or three years now. And we, we kind of felt like after the Texans fired their vice president of football operations, Jack Easterby, a guy who's, you know, had some articles written about him and was always a curious figure with the Texans. We felt like that was going to be the end of the dysfunction. And then lo and behold, uh, you know, Brandon Cooks, who's had a long relationship with Jack Easterby, seems to seems to have become very disgruntled after the departure of Jack Easterby. Uh, is that are they related? Are they not? I don't know. But the, it was like that one l- extra dose of dysfunction when, yeah, the guy that's supposed to be the the model citizen in your locker room is just upset and absent. Um, I, what we hope here in Houston is that this this will finally be the last bit of extreme dysfunction. <laughs> Yeah, drama never ends in the National Football League. I think that's well documented, regardless of the team and so forth. That's the beauty, I guess, and frustration of the league. I want to bounce back to the defensive side of the ball. And we started with the rushing defense and how much they've struggled. Clearly dead last. They've given up 181 rushing yards. You brought up Malik Collins, who's missed the last two games with a chest injury. So two-part question for you, Seth. If he gets back out there and returns, how much does that help you think the run defense, and the return of Christian Harris, who started the season on IR. I think he's played about three games. What can he perhaps do to help boost the front seven? Yeah, um, Malik Collins should help. But they've, you know, they've struggled with him and struggled without him, but they're that much worse without him. Christian Harris is the guy that we're hoping makes a difference in the second half of the season because he, he missed almost all of training camp, so he didn't get any – time even you know against his own team uh much less in preseason games and then missed the start of the season while he was on ir so he's still getting his legs underneath him and he'll flash and do some things really well but then at other times he'll look like a rookie i'm pretty optimistic that he's going to be a good football player we just have to see it all come together um and then you know the other guys at the linebacker position christian Curry. Uh, Christian Kirksey and um, Darrell Wallow is playing a lot right now. They're, they're rotating a few guys in there right now. They're they're kind of suspect too. They've had a rough go of it. So that front seven has those two veteran guys up front that we talked about, and then maybe Christian Harris as we as, as we move along. Uh, but you know, ultimately the the back end of the defense is the strength of this defense. They do as bad as they are between the twenties. They tend to tighten up in the red zone. They, they haven't given up a whole lot of passing touchdowns. Um, you know, for, for a while there, at the beginning of the season, they were actually a pretty highly ranked red zone defense. Now they've fallen down to earth a little bit. But when they get into the red zone, the fact that they have uh, at least a competent core of guys in the secondary, that starts to help the defense out. Those guys can cover smaller spaces. And that's, that's another one of the reasons that the Texans have been able to stick around with teams that, they, they give up a lot of yardage, but then somehow figure out a way to turn touchdowns into field goals. You know, Seth, rookies make rookie mistakes, and that's just the nature of the business. And the question becomes then, how often does the other team take advantage of those? Well, the Texans spent a lot of draft capital on grabbing Stingley in the first round and Petrie in the second round, and yet those guys seem to have held up pretty well, at least from afar. What has been their secret to not making as many fatal mistakes, perhaps, as other rookies might? I think I think some of it is simply that Lovey Smith has played pretty conservative at times. And, you know, it's it's not the Tampa two of the early 2000s um, or or what it might have been, you know, down in uh, either in Chicago or in Tampa or different places that Lovey has been. They've modernized their defense somewhat, but they still play a lot of zone and they still play some soft zones at times. So Stingley, and then, you know, some of the talk this week around here has been, okay, you know, Stingley's doing okay, but Sauce Gardner, who was taken after, you know, one pick after Derek Stingley was taken by the Texans, it seems to be an emerging star in the league. And in my opinion on it is that I think that the Jets, A, are much better defense. So it's a lot easier to be a good defensive player when you're on a good defense. Um, but B, I think the Jets are really using Sauce Gardner up to his level of ability. They're they're putting pressure on him. You know, even when they play zone, it uh, it tends to be a little bit more of an aggressive 
cover three type of like uh, uh, almost like a combo man zone thing where Sauce Gardner is able to, to make plays. Um, Stingley has been asked to do less. And because of that, you know, you're taking a guy who's a man corner and that was supposed to be his calling guard that this guy can hopefully be a Darrell Revis type of guy. And a lot of times you just see him playing a soft cushion coming up and, and making plays in zone coverage. It's not highlight material stuff. And, and what we hope is that it's just a matter of that being on a bad defense that's playing softer zone coverage. And that over time, you know, next year with a better defense and hopefully more aggressive defensive play calls that we'll see more of that. But right now, you know, it looks like Sauce Gardner's gotten off to the early lead. We, we know how that goes usually over the first few seasons. Um, a, a few guys that look great will, will look the opposite and vice versa. So we'll wait and see on that. Seth, while there's been a lot of talk clearly about the rookies in the secondary, the Texans, let's face it, they revamped their secondary. They also brought in a handful of veterans. And one other player I want to highlight, because he also is their punt returner, is Desmond King, who made a name for himself when he was with the Chargers early in his career. Seven passes defense. What has he brought to the back end of this defense? Oh, I'll tell you what. And this is okay. This is one of the frustrating things about the Texans defense is that on any given Sunday, uh, or the rare Thursday night, Des King, Steven Nelson, Jalen Petrie, these defensive backs, those will be the hardest hits on the Texans defense. It's rarely a linebacker. It's rarely a defensive lineman. Um, you know, and it's not, you know, it's not uncommon for the DBs to have the biggest hits because they're in position to do it. But those are the guys that are, that are playing like dogs. You know, like those are the guys that are out there and look like they get it. And, and I think that's, those are, again, the types of veteran players that you want setting an example for those guys. It's just a shame because you'd, you'd love to see it out of the front seven guys at some point. But Des King, uh, Des King, who might play a little less slot now that Tavier Thomas is back, they'll be a little bit more flexible now because um, they have a little more manpower in the defensive backfield. But you'll, you'll probably see him come up and either have at least one good run as a part returner in the game or come up and make a hit. And um, he's a guy, too, you know, started off really hot in his career, was made a pro bowl, was all pro his, his rookie yeah. year, and um, it was a charge, and, and it just didn't work out for whatever reason. So we were kind of skeptical about what he would bring to the table. I, I don't know if he matured. I don't know if it was just a bad fit earlier in his career, but he has been everything you want out of a veteran player like that. So, yeah, he's – um. I, I wish the team were better because I think he'd be getting more attention as, as the right kind of guy. Got to watch the game against Philadelphia. And the one thing that at least it looked like until they ran out of steam, I guess, midway through the third quarter, is that they are playing for Lovey Smith. Do you get the sense that, that he hasn't lost these guys? Yeah, I think, I think so. Um, and, you know, they've got a pretty good blend here of veteran players and rookie players. And, and now they played a lot of rookies. There'll be eight, nine, maybe 10 rookies starting this week, um, you know, depending on who ends up being active. So those guys are always going to be hungry. But I think that Casario, again, wanted to sign guys that he figured could be good in a, in a rough situation. Because, you know, these last two years, they knew that it probably wasn't going to be a winning playoff uh, type of scenario. And they just – they. They misjudged with Brandon Cooks or something happened. But otherwise, I think they've got pretty good dudes out there. And, and that goes a long way. And I think Lovey Smith is part of that. You know, he's, he's, you know, he's no nonsense, but he's also no BS. He's, uh, he doesn't waste a whole lot of time. Um, you know, look, I played for Tom Coughlin. And uh, Coughlin was a different type of guy than Lovey Smith. <laughs> they're, they're going through, <laughs> going through hard times with Lovey Smith might be a little bit easier than like a guy like Tom Coughlin, who I absolutely love. They're just different types of personalities. Seth, before we let you go, I think what's interesting, the Giants are coming off their bye. The Texans, as we talked about, played on Thursday night. So that's a bit of a mini bye. Anything to read into that as a former player in terms of two teams maybe having a number of days in between games or do you not really make much of anything out of that? I, I always say, if it's somebody like Andy Reid uh, or Bill Belichick or somebody that's established – as uh, genuinely kind of a cut above in terms of their ability to strategize, then I worry about it. I would say, and if, if we're looking at um, Brian Dayball, like if we look at the offensive masterminds of these two respective teams, Brian Dayball versus Pep Hamilton, 
I think Brian Dayball has the uh, has the leg up in this scenario. Even though both these both these passing offenses are, I mean, I know you look. The Texans are a weird team in their ability to hang around. I know I know you guys are tired of hearing people talk about various levels of you know whether your whether your record is worth it or not. I, I think we're I think we're far enough along in the season right now that the I don't want to dive into cliches about knowing how to win or what have you, but I think the the ability of Daniel Jones to run um, makes the the lack of a passing offense less of a big deal, and I think Brian Dayball is really good at managing that side of it. So um, I, I think I would give Dayball the edge in that regard. It's the six and two Giants against the one six and one Houston Texans in East Rutherford, New Jersey on Sunday. He's Seth Payne, former NFL defensive lineman. You can hear on Sports Radio 610 in Houston. Seth, greatly appreciate the time and the insight. Look forward to this weekend's game as well as talking down the road. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Seth. Hey, my pleasure, guys. The Giants' official connected TV streaming app, Giants TV, brings original video content and game highlights on demand and direct to big blue fans. Giants TV is free on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire TV, and the Giants mobile app. Do you thank Seth Payne, who covers the Texans again for 610 down in Houston for joining us. We thank Lance and Paul. Now let's head to our weekly sit-down. The voice of the Giants, Bob Papa, had a chance to talk to the head coach of the NYG, Brian Dable. The Giants take on the Houston Texans at MetLife Stadium. Joined, as always, by the head coach of the New York Giants, Brian Dable. And, uh, Coach, coming off the bye, did you feel like the team was energized a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. We've had a good week of practice and uh, looking forward to getting out there in MetLife Stadium in front of our crowd and, and playing some good football. All right, you got the Houston Texans team that comes in. they got a very dynamic running back in Damian Pierce, fourth-round pick out of Florida. And, Coach, um, you know this is a guy that doesn't go down easy. Yards after contact, he's third in the NFL. What makes him so difficult to tackle? Yeah, I think he's built well. He's got good balance and body control, and he's a physical runner. Uh, there's not a, dance, a lot of dancing with him. He gets the ball downhill and, and makes defenders deal with him, and he's, and he's really good at it. Quarterback Davis Mills, second-year player. Uh, he's coming along as a football player. What are some of the things that he does well that you have to be on your P's and Q's for today? Yeah, I think he's a smart football player. You know, it helps with that running game that they have to use their actions and create some space back there in the second level of the defense and makes good decisions. And, you know, we're going to have to do a good job of, of trying to get inside and, on him and, and press the pocket and, and make him make quicker decisions. Statistically, their numbers aren't great defensively, but they have some serious playmakers. Let's start up front with Jerry Hughes, someone that you're familiar with. You know, 13 years, the guy's still getting it done, seven sacks already this season. Um, just talk about the challenges that he poses for your front. Yeah, he's a very smart football player. He's got good first step quickness. He's got a variety of pass bus moves, and he does a good job when he's, when he's on those tackles, setting the edge of the running game, and, you know, he's slippery. He's just a, a crafty veteran that makes a lot of football plays for their team. Then on the back end, they got a couple of rookies, Stingley, uh, the first round draft pick, Petrie, the second round draft pick, and those guys have shown a, an ability to make plays as well. Yeah, Petrie's a very productive player. He's downhill. He's instinctive in the running game. He does a good job of reading the quarterback in the passing game. And and Stingley is you know a high draft pick corner who's got good cover skills. He can play zone. He can play man. He's got good speed to the ball and and good makeup speed when he's you know jumping on crossing routes and in cuts. Um, good football player coach um you know statistically uh they've struggled in stopping the run but as we saw in the game against Philadelphia they did a pretty good job of dealing with the run and then the game got broken open late do fans and media sometimes oversimplify things and just say well they should just run the ball because they're not that good at it yeah you know every team in the league is trying to improve on things that you know maybe aren't where they want it to be and you know, numbers, again, are numbers. They could have a couple really rough games where the numbers skyrocket on them. Um, this, this team is a, a, a good football team that's, that's playing well, um, coached well, and you know, we're going to have to do a good job of, of blocking their movement up front, their extra defender down in the box. Um, they'll, be, they'll be ready for our, for our run game. Obviously, coming off the bye earlier in the week, the news about Xavier McKinney. So you've got to find other ways to kind of fill that role. Is it kind of by committee in which you'll try to fill some of the things that he does well? Yeah, I know Wink always talks about a positionless defense. Um, you know, we have a variety of guys on the back end we have a lot of confidence in. We'll certainly miss Xavier, um, but, you know, there's nothing we can do about that now. we got to get ready to play with the guys that we have, and we're confident in them. As you studied your team during the bye week, um, did some things jump out at you in self-scout without giving away any secrets that you were like, hmm, you know, 
Okay, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, no, I think, look, the bye weeks are good for to go back and, and look at things as a whole. You're always doing that during the week um, from the previous week or the previous two games. Um, yeah, there's certainly things that we looked at in all three areas of our football team to try to improve on, and that's what we did this week. Did the bye come at the right time for you guys here with this stretch run coming? Um, I don't know. I just take them as they come, you know, whether it's the game, whether it's, you know, flying out to Seattle, flying to England, you know, having a bye week, you know, whatever the schedule makers do, that's, that's how we play them. Coach, best of luck today. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate uh, you. We thank Brian Dable, Seth Payne, and, of course, Jalen Smith for joining us on this episode of the Giants Huddle Podcast. Again, a reminder, folks, just go back and listen to those last three episodes. The last one was Brian Baldinger. Before that, Bob Papa talked to Rashad Jennings, then our reporters roundtable. So go back. Last three episodes of the Giants Huddle Podcast. Check those out. And then, of course, prior to that, if you go to our other podcast feed, we had our most recent draft season as we catch everyone up on what's going on in college football. Uh, that popped up on Monday. So go check that out myself, Eric Crocker, Tony Pauline. Find it on your favorite podcast platform. Search for Giants Huddle. Search for Draft Season. Or you can find it on the Giants mobile app or Giants.com slash podcast. I'm John Schmuck. Thanks for joining us on this episode of the Giants Huddle Podcast. We will see you next time, everybody.